Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we are talking all things true crime. I'm coming to you early morning, hair the mess, in pajamas because we know true crime never sleeps and we are getting updates all the time and we have gotten some pretty big updates over the last couple of days and last night in the Dylan Rounds case. So I'm going to break everything down for you. Now, if you haven't heard of the Dylan Rounds case, I highly recommend that you go watch my earlier video that I did on this. There's only one and it is a deep dive that will bring you current with the case, then come back and watch this video. But what I would say, and I'm going to touch on it in a bit here too, is that this case has really taken social media by storm. There are so many different sides to this. A lot of division as well, actually, which is so odd because everybody's shared goal is to find answers for Dylan and hopefully find Dylan himself. But there is a lot of division out there. And so a lot of people are, I don't want to say, hmm, how do I word this? A lot of people are suggesting that certain people who have been reporting on this case are very one-sided and the opposing view doesn't like anything they have to say. They only want to hear this narrative. So what I'm really trying to do here is be a neutral source that puts out all the information. Not all of the parties are going to agree with it because like I said, there is a lot of division. But I think it's important that as a viewer, you hear everything that rolls into this case so that ultimately you can think for yourself, but also maybe it will probe certain questions and get certain answers that will ultimately find a resolution in all of this and the answers that we're looking for. So we're going to jump right in. Tend to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Solving a crime is often compared to solving a puzzle. You have to gather the pieces and it can be pretty tricky to figure out how they all fit together and really find the end solution. So when everything is laid out correctly, you're left with a clear picture. But solving the Dylan Rounds case and the disappearance is like working on five different puzzles simultaneously with all of the pieces mixed up on one table. The details of this case have gotten so convoluted, mostly because all of us, like anything that we have to go on, is conjecture from locals and the bare minimum information from two small news outlets. From what I've seen, there has been actually no national news coverage about Dylan. All the information that we have to go on has been gathered by investigative interviews, research done by true crime channels, and even regular people. Even without, though, the widespread media attention, so many people from all over the world have gotten invested in finding Dylan and uncovering the truth of what goes on in small towns like Lucen, Utah, and Monteo, Nevada. So in my first video about Dylan Rounds, I thought I had a pretty good idea of who might be involved in his disappearance, and also a little bit about the culture and way of life out there in the desert. But now that so much more information has come out and after reading and listening to hours of conversation, clarifications, theories, criminal backgrounds, and much more, my opinion has completely changed. And again, if you aren't familiar with the Dylan Rounds case, I definitely would recommend starting at the beginning with the first video, which I will link here. But I'm going to go ahead and just give a very brief top line summary of the case and where we're at so far so that everybody can follow along and even get a little bit of a refresher. Dylan Rounds is a 19-year-old young man living in Lucen, Utah. Lucen is an extremely rural town. I hate that word. I never know how to say it right. And it really kind of actually feels like a ghost town. And it's a town in the desert with a population of around 50 people or so. So even though Lucent isn't usually what you would picture when you would think of lush, green pastures, of farmland, and, you know, crops, Dylan, with the help of his grandpa Larry, purchased 640 acres to transform into a farm of his very own, and at only 19 years old. And Dylan had known what he wanted to do his entire life, and he really only had one interest, and that was farming. 2022 is the third year that Dylan has been working on this land that he and his grandfather had purchased. He had spent the last couple of years doing backbreaking work preparing the soil, which is very alkaline due to it being so close to Great Salt Lake, and really trying to prepare it to be conducive with growing a crop. And this year, he finally had something. His first crop of grain was the fruit of all of his heart, soul, and sweat that he had poured into his land that so many people told him would never come to fruition, that never would produce anything other than maybe a tumbleweed. Dylan was excited about his first crop and was in a really good place in his life. He had also made some close friends in Lucen, as well as in the nearest town of Monteo, Nevada. 
He spent a lot of time in Monteo as well because there really wasn't anything to do in Lucen. And even though Monteo doesn't have a much bigger population than Lucen, it did have a few restaurants and a bar where you can get a burger, beer, socialize with people, and really kind of feel like you're not isolated. Dylan was living in a trailer on his land that didn't have running water, so a lot of the time he would spend the night in a motorhome across the street from the saddle store that was owned by one of his good friends, Kurt Wadesworth. In the last video I made about Dylan, I talked about how Kurt and Dylan possibly had a romantic relationship, but this has yet to be confirmed. Dylan's mother, Candace Cooley, and father, Justin Rounds, were divorced when he was only around four years old, and he had a few stepfather figures throughout his life. He and his two other siblings spent the majority of their time at their father's house or with their grandparents on their father's side, Larry and Karen Rounds. And this might be because after the divorce, Candace spent some time away from her children trying to settle down to find the right life partner and wasn't able to provide a stable environment necessarily for the kids while her life was so up in the air. Dylan did find a lot of stability, support, and understanding, though, from his grandparents, who were willing to help him fulfill this dream of becoming a farmer. Even though times had been tough in the past with Dylan and his mother's relationship, it seemed that they had gotten closer in the last year or so. And Candace has said, too, that in interviews that she and Dylan spoke several times a week, and he called his father and grandparents multiple times a week as well. One of the most recent calls that Candace received from her son was about a strange encounter Dylan had in the desert. He told his mom he came across a bloodied man with no shoes who asked for a ride and to use his phone. Dylan told her that while he did allow the man to use his phone, he didn't give him a ride. And strangely, the details of this encounter were proven to be a little different. And Dylan actually did give this man a ride, who turned out to be a man by the name of Chase Venstra. Now, Chase Venstra is known around Monteo and Lucen as a thief, a drifter, a druggy type person, and he definitely has a lengthy criminal record. A few days after this phone call with his mother on Friday, May 28th, Dylan received a call from his grandmother, Karen, at around 6.30 a.m. He quickly told her that he had to get off the phone because it was starting to rain and he needed to get his seed truck inside. On Dylan's land, the camper he stayed in was about five miles from the shed where he would house his seed truck. It was very important to get the truck in there quickly because if the seeds got wet, they could be ruined. So Karen waited for a call back from her grandson, but when she didn't get one, she began to worry. And it wouldn't be hard for someone to worry about a 19-year-old out alone in the middle of the desert, surrounded by heavy farming machinery and just being so isolated. So after several hours, Karen decided to call a family friend, Don, who used to work for Dylan. They had parted ways recently due to a dispute about what work Dylan was prioritizing, but it's been said that the split was amicable. Karen asked Don if he had heard from Dylan, and when he said that he hadn't, she asked if he would go and check on him. Don and another man, who used to work on the farm as well, named Jim, went to check around the property to see if they could find Dylan. When they didn't immediately find him, they figured he must have been in Monteo, where he frequently stayed. They didn't call Karen back until Monday to inform her that they still hadn't seen or spoken to Dylan. So Karen called around to some more people, including D JD, Dylan's best friend, who then called Candace and Justin Rounds to let them know that nobody had seen or spoken to their son for several days. Candace and Justin, immediately knowing something was not right, got together and made the drive from their homes in Idaho to their son's land in Utah. On their way, Candace called the Box Elder Police Department, who had jurisdiction over Lucen, to report that their son was missing. When they arrived at Dylan's land, the only thing out of the ordinary was that Dylan wasn't there. There really wasn't anything out of place at all until police called Justin and Candace over to see what they had found behind a dirt pile just yards away from the grain shed. Behind the dirt was Dylan's boots, which everyone in his life have emphatically said he would never be without. It wasn't until these boots were found that true panic started to set in for Dylan's parents, and they knew their son didn't just walk away from his farm willingly, especially in the desert without his beloved boots. So that would begin the massive search for Dylan. Dylan's parents have said in interviews that at first the Box Elder County Police weren't very much help and definitely dropped the ball in some areas, such as not testing a spot that resembled blood on his boots for almost a week. They also had allowed Candace and Justin to break out one of Dylan's truck windows and even drive it home when it should have been left untouched to gather evidence. And Monteo is just across the Utah and Nevada border in a, a county called Elko, Elko. And when the Elko County police stepped in, there was a much bigger push in this investigation. With two police departments and hundreds of search volunteers, scent dogs, drones, planes, and so many other resources utilized, it's hard to comprehend that not a trace of Dylan has been found yet, at least none released to the public. With little to no answers, Dylan's grandparents and extended family began to feel desperate. 
and they were frustrated that their son's ex-wife was taking control over the narrative about Dylan. It's not a secret that the two families haven't gotten along over the years, and the Rounds family decided to hire a private investigator, James or Jim Terry, to help gather more information in hopes of getting a lead about what happened to Dylan. I briefly explained that there has been some contention, not only with this private investigator and their family, but in the true crime community as a whole about this P.I. Jim Terry and the way he delivers information. P.I. Jim is the one who uncovered some information about Kurt and Dylan possibly having that intimate relationship, and that was not something that Candace seemed to want to be made public about her son. And ultimately, after several heated arguments with the family, they ended up parting ways with the P.I. Jim, possibly against the Rounds family wishes. But apparently, and I want to say allegedly, Candace was the driving force with parting ways with him. Candace said in an interview that Jim was only interested in conspiracy theories, which led him to go out and find information on his own about Candace in hopes to prove her statements about him uncredible. And there really has been a huge feud out there between not only Candace and Jim, but also between anybody who really listens and entertains what the PI is saying and still saying versus people who are believing and choosing to believe only the narrative that Candace is saying. There is just a huge divide out there. And that's what I was referring to earlier when I said, I'm going to just kind of lay all the cards out on the table here so that you can make a judgment and opinion for yourself, not hearing just one-sided information. So a public statement was made on the official Finding Dylan Rounds Facebook group and on a local news channel that the family was no longer working with this PI Jim. The grandparents of Dylan Rounds hired this private investigator to help find him, but his theories aren't going well with the family. No matter what the scenario is, it involves two people and two bits of evidence. That's just been an absolute mess. Um, and that's why I went public with the phone conversations. Dylan Rounds' mother is upset with a private investigator who was hired by Dylan's grandparents in Idaho. He was paid to find out what happened to Dylan, who was last heard from May 28th. That investigator, James Terry, has gone on several YouTube channels and radio talk shows expressing his theories behind Dylan's disappearance. The details of this case, which I was verified on finally last night by several callers on radio shows, have now vindicated me from some of the things I was saying. Terry claimed Dylan got involved with the wrong crowd in the town of Montello, Nevada. The community of 50 people is about 30 miles from the nearby town of Lucen on the Utah side of the border. Dylan's farm is on the outskirts of Lucen. When his family arrived on Memorial Day weekend, it was abandoned. His boots were found a short distance from his farm property. Those boots are now being analyzed. Box Elder County Sheriff's Office is now calling it a missing persons criminal investigation. And the FBI has also joined the investigation. But the social media chatter by the private investigator has Dylan's family cutting ties with him. This guy has taken this story and all the information we have given him, he's not collected this himself. He has twisted into this sick, disgusting plot that he has changed three times. Cooley recently took to social media posting the following. Once we decided to go a different direction, unethically, Mr. Terry has taken to sharing these rumors, conspiracy theories, and crazy accusations into the public eye. I'm still looking into it mostly to clear my name because of what's been put out on social media and by Candace Cooley, who I was never uh, working for or with. But Cooley says Dylan's grandparents no longer want him either. Dylan's not here to defend himself, and Dylan is not a Trust me. The private investigator gained notoriety after solving missing persons cases in Michigan and in Boise, Idaho. But in this case, the family doesn't want him involved. We're missing in Utah. Marcus Ortiz, ABC4 News. Two camps have incidentally come out of the disagreement between Candace and P.I. Jim. One camp thinks that Jim is just trying to help, and even if his delivery and personality isn't for everyone and might be considered abrasive, he has been able to uncover the majority of the information that all of us know about in this case. But then there is the other camp that wants people to disregard everything that P.I. Jim says and to overlook Candace's and the family's pa past because, in their opinion, none of that has anything to do with finding Dylan. So while I do agree that we should treat the families of a missing child with empathy, I also don't think it's fair to disregard everything that is said by someone who clearly seems to have a lot of information, even if they don't see eye to eye with the person. 
And at the end of the day, the PI Jim isn't a cop. So many people in the town of Lucent and Monteo have felt comfortable coming to him and talking to him about a lot of what has gone on there. And they've given some information to him that wouldn't necessarily want to be said to law enforcement for a lot of different reasons. Many people there have records and warrants themselves, and some are involved in really shady businesses, so some don't also want to be looked at as a snitch and then have a target on their back. Regardless, something about Jim Terry has had a lot of people talking, and I think all, that all of that information is truly valuable. It seems kind of like Candace didn't appreciate the personal information that P.I. Jim was uncovering about her and possibly her son, which would possibly make her look bad in the public eye, and again, discussing Dylan's sexual orientation, it seemed like that was, you know, over the line for her, overstepping, which I can understand to some degree as well, unless there is evidence that it is somehow related to the crime or the disappearance. So whatever P.I. Jim has done or said, or anything irrelevant to Dylan's disappearance that Candace has done or said, I'm not on either side. I feel sorry for the Rounds family that they're going through this and not knowing what happened to their son. And at the end of the day, I'm on Dylan's side. I'm not on the PI side. I'm not on the family side. I'm on Dylan's side. All of this is about Dylan and all of the drama, the unnecessary bashing, the hateful words, the division. It's not going to help reach the goal, which is to find Dylan and to get justice for whatever happened to him. So that being said, in my last video, I kind of went over some possible theories, and I talked about the people who may have been likely involved in, in Dylan's disappearance. I talked about Don, who could be considered a disgruntled ex-employee and may have gotten into an argument with Dylan or had a grudge against him. I talked about Kurt, who Dylan possibly had a relationship with, and it's been said that Kurt, Dylan, and one of Kurt's brothers, Troy, had a vigilante group of sorts where they would police the desert around the properties and even pull guns on squatters or drug users and thieves. And so I thought it could be possible that an accident happened, like an incidental shooting during one of their vigilante rounds. A lot of information came back about Kurt's brother Troy and how he had a criminal past of being abusive towards women, had committed SA, and even allegedly held some people captive before. It would be easy to think that anyone involved in those sorts of crimes could be capable of harming Dylan. Then I discussed Chase Venstra as another possible suspect especially since there was a strange phone call made from Kurt to Candace saying that Chase and his friend Robert were holding Dylan captive at Robert's house, even though Chase had an alibi of being on camera at a pizza restaurant hundreds of miles away. So those were the people everyone was looking at as possibly being involved. And before all of the updates I'm about to share with you, because I promise we're going to get there, I think the majority of people thought that the w Wadesworth or Wadsworth, however you pronounce it, were most likely the suspects, Kurt and Troy. However, with so much new information, I'm not really sure what I think anymore. Since my last video, I have had more people to add to the list of key players, and the funny thing is, they're all people that I mentioned before, but just kind of skimmed over, not knowing they would actually be the ones to start having the most evidence stack up against them. It's kind of like they just flew under the radar there for a bit and were letting other people possibly be the fall guys for their sketchy behavior. So first I explained that there was an older man named Don, who was the family friend of Dylan's grandpa. He had worked on Dylan's farm until their disagreement, and he probably just didn't appreciate being told what to do by a 19-year-old. I also briefly mentioned a man named Jim that took this in stride as a quote. Well, the more we have found out about this Jim character, the more highly unlikely it is that he took anything with a Dylan in stride. Jim, or James Brenner, who I will refer to as JB, since we have two men who go by Jim and James, has been described as a grumpy old man. JB is in his 60s and has a pretty disturbing past. JB has charges ranging from misdemeanor assault to assault with intent to murder. He has spent a lot of time behind bars, and being a felon, he is unable to legally own firearms. JB has been living in a trailer owned by Don on what was originally thought to be Dylan's land. The trailer is pretty much right next to the grain shed, where Dylan keeps his seed truck. However, through land parcel records, we can see that Dylan's grandpa Larry purchased the 640 acres from a man named Joseph, but Joseph retained some of the land during that sale. The land he decided to retain happens to be where the grain shed is located, but Dylan did have permission to utilize it for his seed truck. Just follow along with me here. Joseph knew that JB was staying on this parcel of land in Don's camper, and it has been said that he was supposed to be acting sort of like security of the shed. Strangely, in most news broadcasts, JB has been referred to as a squatter, which I think makes most people assume that he isn't supposed to be there, and is kind of an unwanted homeless person. 
But actually, JB owns his own acreage in Utah as well and was living there until his camper burned down. There was a time that he actually lived on Kurt's land too, and recently I think that Don was being a good friend to him by letting him stay in that extra trailer of his. Interestingly enough, in an interview with Kurt, he stated that Joe Checo, Joseph, the guy who sold the land, is actually the one who introduced him to Dylan. And that's how Kurt started working for Dylan here and there as well. Kurt had a lot of the tools that Dylan needed to use, like a backhoe when he was digging his pond and preparing the land and things like that. So from the farm as well as hanging out in Monteo, all of these people were kind of connected and knew each other one way or another. But their commonality was Dylan Rounds and his grandfather, Larry. Now, in my first video, I mentioned that there was an alpaca farmer in Lucen, which at the time I didn't realize would become such a key source of information and a wealth of knowledge about everyone in this town. The alpaca farmer named Ty Corbin has been brave enough to come forward and speak on several podcasts by way of P.I. Jim Terry and has been able to paint a picture of what all of these people really are like. With nothing to lose or gain by being a part of any of this, you can tell that he really just wants to help find Dylan, and he feels greatly for Justin Rounds. He's even said that if he did have any information that helped find Dylan, he wouldn't accept the money because he holds Justin in such high regard and really just wants to help. He has cooperated Jim Terry's statements, the P.I., about the Wadesworth family, Kurt and Troy, and has given more information about Chase Venstra as well. Chase apparently doesn't have a driver's license or a car and has been getting rides from his friend Robert Aviles. Ty knows this family well because he has given Robert's mother, who is described as having a slight mental delay and easily manipulated by her son, a place to stay at his home. Robert had been driving with Chase out of Lucen and out to Lucen, actually, and several people had reported things like stolen guns, stolen four-wheelers, tools, and believed that these two men were somehow in connection. Just the day before Dylan went missing, Robert admitted to driving Chase out to Lucen, where Dylan lived, and he actually since has been charged on other unrelated charges for having guns as a felon. About a week before Dylan went missing, Chase was stopped by police and was found to have guns on him, which, him being a felon as well, is illegal. So why was he not arrested then and there? The only answer anyone has been able to give is that police out there just do not care enough to do the paperwork. However, Chase has since been arrested on unrelated charges as well for crimes based out of Montana and is set to have an extradition hearing. So that will determine whether or not to keep him where he is or let him be extradited out back to Montana. So if that's the case, officers probably don't think he has anything to do with Dylan Rounds or else they would push to keep him in Idaho or Nevada most likely. In the interview with Kurt, he strongly denies any romantic involvement with Dylan and describes their relationship more like an older mentor and protective figure, being that Kurt is in his 60s, and he said that they just have a lot in common. Many people, myself included, think that it is a little weird, just how much detailed information, though, Kurt seems to know about Dylan's life, but I guess it's possible that they just have a close friendship like that. And either way, I don't think either of their sexualities really have much to do with D Dylan's disappearance at this point. I know it was an important detail to establish because finding out who a victim spends the most time with is usually an, a very important piece to understanding what has happened to them. But it just doesn't seem like, in my opinion, Kurt would have much of a motive to hurt Dylan. At most, he may know about what happened, but it doesn't seem like he or Troy are involved at this point. But again, only time will tell because we're learning things every single day. In one of the early interviews, Candace briefly mentioned a gate that Dylan had to drive through to put his seed truck in the grain shed. Dylan would have to call JB to ask him to open that gate with a key to get his truck in. So we're going back to JB here now. It's a little unclear who put this gate up, but it seems to be becoming one of the focal points of animosity between JB and Dylan. It's been speculated that Joseph, who sold the land, was possibly a little bit jealous that Dylan was able to get a crop going after only three years on the land when he wasn't able to make anything happen there for himself. Maybe out of jealousy, he had a gate put up or asked Jim, JB, to build a gate to make it difficult for Dylan to use the grain shed. I don't know. Another possibility is that Dylan had been talking about purchasing the small parcel of land with the grain shed, which would likely mean that JB would get, boom, kicked off. JB possibly put up the fence in resentment towards Dylan and to make it difficult for him to use that shed. So if you look at the fence, you can see it's pretty haphazard and not really meant to be like a regular fence or anything. It's just kind of like a nuisance and to make it annoying for a truck or vehicle to get through. 
Dylan being such a strong-willed young man, though, and not wanting anything to happen to his seeds, it's possible that he called JP to ask for the key, and he didn't answer. Or maybe Dylan just plowed through it out of annoyance over the fence, which caused JB to get upset. Who knows? Because JB is said to have a pretty bad temper. So maybe he was angry that Dylan got inside the fence and he went to deal with him at the grain shed. Who knows? But one creepy piece of information is that JB has been seen recently wearing a hat that looks exactly like the hat that Dylan always wore. So did he take this hat off Dylan's head after he did something terrible to him, or do they just so happen to have the same hat? Jim Brenner, or again, JB, was just named as an official suspect in the disappearance of Dylan by Box Elder Police Department. He was arrested for unrelated charges initially, surprise, surprise, because he had firearms as a felon, but he hasn't been charged with anything official to Dylan's disappearance yet, but he has now been named as an official suspect. JB has several guns in his trailer, musket-type guns, which felons are allowed, and then a rifle, which he actually asked his friend, referred to as DH in the arrest warrant, to hide for him. That friend, who many people speculate to be Don, turned the firearm into police. Neither Chase or Robert have been named official suspect or charged, charged with anything related to Dylan yet either. I think it's interesting that all of these men have been partaking in criminal activity and had warrants and guns long before any of this, but they are all now, all of a sudden, being arrested and kind of held on standby, it seems, and held accountable for different charges. It's pretty obvious to me that the police and the FBI don't want anyone important going far. So while they have been overlooking the same behavior for years, they're now able to use it to their advantage and keep them wrangled while they build this case and figure out what happened to Dylan. The reward has now gone up from 50000 to 100000 for information leading the case to discovering what happened to Dylan and a conviction. And I find it really surprising that nobody in that small town, many of whom have issues with drugs, are living in sheds with no running water, and could have their lives changed completely by that money, aren't coming forward. That leads me to believe that they must not know, and whoever did this did it alone, or with a very small, tight-knit group. Or potentially maybe they're scared. I think it would be really a really bad look for the Box Elder police if it comes out that they just let Chase Venster go with guns illegally just days before Dylan went missing, and it ends up being that Chase did something to Dylan. And I spoke in the last video about how Dylan received a large sum of cash from his grandfather, and only part of that money has been accounted for. Dylan was apparently bragging about all of his money at one of the bars in Monteo. So maybe Chase and Robert learned about this money, and it was a robbery gone bad. There had been thefts of four-wheelers in the area, so maybe that's what they used to get rid of Dylan's body in one of the many mine shafts out there in the desert. Or maybe they used Robert's car to drive him far away. When Chase was picked up in the desert by his father the day of the disappearance, he was 50 miles away from Monteo. And I highly doubt that he walked 50 miles in the desert to get picked up by his dad and then go to a Little Caesars and grab a pizza. I mean, I guess it's possible, but he supposedly had no shoes on either. So could he have done something to Dylan and gotten a ride from Robert to where he was then picked up by his father? Then he went to the Little Caesars to create an alibi. That would have given him a lot of time to hide a body. There was a lot of discussion about Dylan's truck being pressure washed as well. Candace stated in interviews that her son never washed his truck. So is it possible that whoever killed Dylan or took Dylan used his own truck to transport the body somewhere? Kurt said in an interview that he had been complaining to Dylan about a lot of nasty grease buildup in his truck bed. He said that since Dylan often had Kurt's tools back there, whenever they went to get the tools, they would be covered in this grease and that their hands would be covered in it as well. So Kurt said that Dylan used his pressure washer to get the grease out of the truck bed, and he even said that he had called Dylan out for not washing the wheel wells. So is this just a cover story for one of Kurt's friends who used the truck? That remains unknown at this time, but most people don't think whoever committed this crime could have done it alone. When thinking about what could have killed Dylan, I figured if someone shot him in the grain shed, then there would be blood spatter everywhere, of course. However, someone who knows a lot more about guns than me explained that if a rifle was used, like the one JB had, with full metal jacket bullets, then there really wouldn't be too much blood spatter. Unlike a hollow point bullet, a full metal jacket would enter the body and then would just bounce around in there, creating internal damage. This would happen with a pistol as well, and it just so happens that Dylan's 40 caliber pistol is missing. So could someone have killed Dylan with his own gun? 
These are just the questions I'm asking myself when trying to really work out what could have happened. JB is also over 230 pounds, so I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for him to have choked or knocked Dylan out with either of his fists or over the head or with something like a shovel, especially if he, he was in a rage. I definitely think he could have overpowered him because Dylan was only around 130 to 140 pounds, so he would need his pistol for self-defense. But if he were disarmed, he would be pretty defenseless against two or more men or one crazy criminal wheeling a gun. That leads me to my next question. With so many criminals in Lucen, other than the inexpensive land, why would Dylan's grandparents choose to help their grandson buy land out there out of all places? From all of the land in Utah and Idaho, why there? As people who care about their grandson and who have friendships with people out there, surely his grandparents knew what he was getting into or knew that it was dicey at best. And I may have briefly mentioned it before, but it is a fact that Dylan's grandparents are high up respected members of the LDS church. Now, I am not going to go off on a religious tirade, but just listen here. While it's obvious that they loved their grandson, some people think that they wanted to place him somewhere where he would be kept busy doing what he loved, but where prying eyes of the church couldn't judge his love life. Maybe they knew Dylan was interested in men, which in the LDS church and other fundamentalist religions is considered one of the worst sins. And I know sexuality, religion, politics, and all those topics are sensitive and hard to navigate through. But when it's something to consider when trying to figure out what on earth happened to a 19-year-old kid and what he was doing out there, you kind of got to look at everything. He was practically a sitting duck in a pond of people on the registry, drug users and criminals. While I'm sure Dylan could take care of himself and hold his own, it just seems like such a bizarre place for a young man who is just getting started on life and who is still so impressionable. To be surrounded by those types of people and so isolated, I feel like there's, you know, I'm not a farmer, but I feel like there's plenty of other areas where you would be able to obtain cheap land. And it's not known for crops either. So the fact that it was a challenge for him too, I don't know. There's something weird here, guys. Another piece of evidence that is confusing to me is that there was a call made from Dylan's phone and a ping at 4 p.m. the afternoon he'd spoken to his grandmother in the morning. Now, supposedly, that call was made to the grain shed landowner, Joseph. But when asked what the voicemail said, Joseph said he was unable to retrieve the voicemail. And the police are the only ones, apparently, who can access it. I wasn't aware it was possible for the police to, you know, get a voicemail before you even listen to it or even after. But apparently, that's what they did. So could Dylan have been calling to complain about the fence or about JB, which made JB angry enough to hurt Dylan? Also, if Dylan went to put the truck in super early in the morning, and that's when it's speculated that this all went down, then who would have made that call and voicemail? Could it have been whoever did something to Dylan, calling Joseph to let him know? Was it an accidental call? Was it somebody who didn't have a cell phone of their own, and so they were using Dylan's to make the drop, to make, you know, to let them know what was going on? In actuality, none of us can really be certain when or where something happened to Dylan, other than it was between 6 a.m. that morning and a few days later when Don told his grandmother that they hadn't seen him. But if the voicemail were made by Dylan, that would at least narrow down the timeline a little bit more. There are just so many possibilities, but it's apparent that the men who more than likely had something to do with this are currently in jail, even though it's on, you know, separate charges. Ty Corbin has said that during one of the searches for Dylan, he and Robert found something in the desert that belonged to Dylan, and his father Justin asked Ty not to mention it to anyone. And Ty has kept that promise, but it makes me wonder what it could have been. There was also a watermelon rind and a Coke can found during the search, which are two of Dylan's favorite things. So was Dylan out in the desert maybe doing some kind of vigilante work with Kurt and Troy and an accident happened? Or could those things have been planted as decoy evidence or maybe left there from a previous night? Whatever they found in the desert of Dylan's was enough for the FBI to get involved because after that is when they came and momentum in this case really started picking up. However, in the last couple of days, the family and police put out another press release asking the people stop doing their own searches for Dylan. Is that because they already know where he is and they don't want to, you know, compromise any sort of evidence or convolute it at all? I don't know. Do they already have him or know for sure that they have the guy who does? Either way, it's weird that if they don't want people searching that they haven't taken down the reward. 
I know a lot of information had previously come out, primarily from P.I. Jim, about Candace and her past with her debts, the volatile relationship between her, Justin Rounds, and her children, etc. And I think Jim was so adamant about releasing that information to make people see that her credibility could be challenged, since she challenged his research and he wants to protect his business. I don't necessarily think it was needed to help find Dylan, but I understand why maybe he felt like he needed to do that and share that information. Maybe it just wasn't the right time, though. I also think he wanted to prove that Dylan was, in fact, not straight so that people didn't start to question all the other information that he was putting out. Regardless, all of that might be true, but I think that there are some other more realistic avenues that this case is going down. One thing is for sure, this case is definitely you know, put a huge spotlight on an area of the country that has been largely ignored by law enforcement for a very long time. A lot of other shady business practices, unregistered people that should be on the registry and problems with theft will probably be dealt with now. And hopefully the good people who live there won't feel like they have to do their own police work anymore and can feel safe. So that's pretty much where everything is at right now with the Dillon's Rounds case. We have a suspect who's in custody, a few actually, one main one that the police have actually named. And I'm sorry if this seemed a little scattered. It's just new information comes out fast, almost hourly, and things change, so it's really hard to make sure that the information I talk about is even still relevant. But for right now, Jim Brenner is for sure an official suspect. Chase Venstra is a person of interest, and Robert is also a person of interest. And I think there is still something sketchy there with the Wadesworth brothers, just maybe not necessarily related to Dylan's disappearance. And I'm sure there is at least one other person out there who knows more than what they're saying. Anyways, it feels like they are very close to charging someone, and hopefully that will mean finding out where Dylan is and getting closure for his family. So let me know if you have anything else to add or who you think is the main suspect and what their motive for doing something to Dylan would be. I will keep you guys updated, and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.